you want a vision of the future, Winston, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Someone is trying to teach me a lesson in futility. Why am I the only one who isn't killed? They will run you dizzy. They will pile falsehood on top of falsehood until you can't tell a lie from the truth and you won't even want to. That's how the powerful keep their power. Don't you read the papers? I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. I'm going to get your money for you. But if you don't get the President of the United States on that phone, you know what's going to happen to you? What? You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. The world is a college of corporations, inexorably determined by the immutable bylaws of business. The world is a business, Mr. Beale. It has been since man crawled out of the slime. Welcome to another episode of Our Interesting Times. It's my pleasure to have Dr. E. Michael Jones back on the show. Dr. Jones is a historian, prolific writer, and editor of Culture Wars magazine. Among, among his many books are The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit and Its Impact on the Modern on I'm sorry, on World History, The Slaughter of Cities, Barren Metal, A History of Capitalism as a Conflict Between Labor and Usury, which will be part of our discussion tonight. Uh, his latest book, I just learned, The Broken Pump in Tanzania. Julius Nyeri and the Collapse of Development Economics just came out uh, just the past few days, I understand, Dr. Jones? That's right. That's so, right. Just got copies. Okay, so now people can place orders for, for that book? Yes, yes. It's on Amazon, or you can go to the culturewars.com website. Excellent. Okay, I look forward it's, to It's about, a, a, a basically a history of what happened in Africa after independence, the independence movement of the 1960s. Excellent. Um, also, of course, you are um, uh, a subscription to Culture Wars magazine can be purchased at culturewars.com. As well as, uh, go That's right. And, go in there to look at all your books and buy those books. Great. Excellent. Well, tonight, again, I mentioned we, I want to discuss at least part of the uh, <laughs> part of Barren Metal. I, had, I finished it. Um, excellent book. And um, Congratulations. <laughs> I know it covers 800 years of history. So it, it's a monumental work. Uh, so not one interview or not, not even a few interviews can really cover uh, cover it really to give it uh, its due. But there's some uh, key points in the book that I want to talk about tonight. One was um, British empiricism versus German idealism. Um, and also just the idea of the Anglo-American empire based on usury and the German idea of labor. And how those, those ideas con conflicted in, in the late 19th and 20th century which led to the, the world wars and perhaps the Cold War and even what we're seeing today played out with the uh, Anglo-American Empire trying to uh, maintain its, its world hegemony. Uh, so, Dr. Jones, uh, German uh, idealism versus British empiricism. Uh, basically, Adam Smith, Isaac Newton, the Scottish Enlightenment versus Johann Victor, uh, Heinrich Petsch, and uh, Bishop von Kettler. So, let's, let's get into this. Yeah, you can't really understand England unless you start with the uh, Reformation. And the Reformation, uh, we are now in the going to have the fifth hundredth anniversary mm -hmm. of Luther's posting of his 95 theses at Wittenberg. Um, if you look at it from a German perspective, it's a little bit confusing because you tend to think it's a theological issue. The Reformation is really not about theology. 
the Reformation is about theft. And this is crystal clear if you look at England. There was no theological justification whatsoever for the Reformation in England. There was no Luther over there. It was just pure, unadulterated theft of church property. That's all it was. The um, Henry VIII saw what Luther had done uh, in Germany, uh, tried the same thing, was successful beyond his wildest dreams, ended up losing it all, uh, but basically stole the church property. At this point, England is cut off from the Western tradition. No matter how they try to disguise the fact, they're cut off from political legitimacy, they're cut off from the philosophical tradition, the theological tradition. They're on their own. They're an island in, out, in the, out in the ocean, and they're on their own, basically, philosophically as well. The only real um, uh, ideology they had was magic, and this was, of course, uh, the work of John Dee. He, car he uh, carried uh, the torch for the uh, hermetic tradition or the occult tradition. Uh, which was basically Neoplatonism that had come into Europe via the Medicis a century uh, before John Dee. John Dee was a working for the British CIA of the time for Walsingham. He was a spy. He was an agent. And they thought they were going to use magic as their basic technology. Uh, this lasted for a while, and then uh, the continental tradition caught up with them. Descartes' mentor and friend, Father Mersenne, had a debate with uh, Robert Flood, who was basically the, the inheritor of Dee's hermetic tradition, and just obliterated him. And at this point, England stands naked uh, before the world. They have no justification for what they're doing, no moral justification, nothing. It's just naked power. And you can see this in... Uh, the plays of Shakespeare, where Shakespeare is the Catholic Englishman trying to come to grips with a, a regime that has no legitimacy, no underpinning, nothing, just nothing. It's pure naked power, that's all. And at this point, the philosophy uh, with Descartes uh, becomes a continental issue, and England has nothing to say. This lasted, uh, Flood was part of what became the Royal Society, and it lasted until Isaac Newton came along. And Newton basically legitimatized magic by calling it science. And we have the beginning of science here, what we call science, which in our day is carried on by people like Bill Nye, the science guy, who uses the magic word science to justify the schemes of the ruling class, like birth control <laughs> and stuff like that. That's what science is there to do. Uh, and at this point, Newtonian physics becomes uh, the backbone of uh, basically now the now the British have something to say for the first time in centuries they have something to say and they have a plan and this becomes part of their covert warfare. Uh, Des Desagulier was a Huguenot who uh, became uh, Newton's um, assistant. He was also a a, a leader. In, in the Masonic Lodge. The Whig Party took over the Masonic Lodges in 1721 turned them into instruments of covert warfare, which actually brought out over through the monarchy in, in France. And Freemasonry, uh, science, this became what we call the English ideology, or I guess we'd call it now empiricism, British empiricism. And British empiricism is the famous, the famous line from Newton is kind of the basis of it. Hypothese non fingo. I frame no hypotheses. In other words, I don't have this. Is not me. This isn't about me. I'm just looking at the world, and I'm just telling you what I see in the world. And this has, is in many ways, it's a very effective cover for what you're doing, uh, because basically, what was Newton doing? He was basically bringing back paganism. His system, now he, he did something work. I don't want to de de uh, denigrate what he did. He came up with the inverse square law. I, I understand the inverse square law. It's a good idea. It's a valid idea. But he used it to smuggle in basically a cosmology 
that was anti-Christian and pagan. It was Empedocles. Uh, the universe is made up of love and strife. He got that through the Hermetic tradition. He was the uh, one biographer called him the last alchemist. And to give you some idea of the, the real face of the English or sky, whatever you want to call it, English Enlightenment, there is Newton and John Locke engaging in alchemical experiments in Newton's apartment in Cambridge, trying to turn lead into gold or something like that. So we have empiricism now, and it's basically, we're just looking at the world. We're not projecting anything onto the world. We're just looking at it. And that became the most effective way of projecting British power in the world. And the first success they had, they had been fighting with Spain, you know, over who was going to rule the world. They defeated the Spanish Armada. They had pirates and terrorists like Sir Francis Drake. Uh, who would basically steal the gold that Spain was bringing in from the New World. The lesson from this is, if you're going to steal something in England, don't steal a spoon, okay? <laughs> because they'll hang you if you steal a spoon. But if you steal uh, all of the monasteries in England, they'll make you a knight. <clears throat> if you steal all the gold on the Spanish main, they'll make you a knight. So be big in your thinking when you're if you're a thief, an English thief. This is all... If you've ever seen the Pirates of Penzance, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan uh, deal with this issue there about pirates and the history of piracy uh, in England. So basically, uh, you've got this. Uh, we're just looking just the facts, ma'am. And New, uh, Adam Smith comes along and takes this essentially pagan system, which is stating that the world is perfect. Because if you put love and strife together, you get perfect circular motion and there's nothing you can do about it. And you don't want to do anything about it. So Newton takes, I'm sorry, Adam Smith takes this and he applies it to the economy. And he says basically, well, uh, uh, what Newton said was it's, it's not love and strife, it's gravity and inertia. You know, if you leave things go, uh, inertia means everything flies off in a straight line. Gravity means everything gets pulled toward the center. You put those two motions together and you get perfect circular motion, which means the universe is perfect and you don't want to interfere with it at all. I'm saying in my book that basically this was this was basically Newton talking about capitalism. He was talking about the economic system in England in a covert way. And the English always do this. They say, well, I'm talking about biology. I'm talking about physics, hypothesis, non-fingo. I'm not talking, but you're really just projecting your own worldview onto the universe. And Adam Smith did this, of course, in The Wealth of Nations, um, because he said, well, it's, it's self-interest and competition, which is love and strife and gravity and inertia in the economic realm. And this is where it really becomes important because what you, what you, this means is you can't interfere in the economic system. Now, Adam Smith was a professor of moral philosophy, which is why he wrote about economics, because economics was a department of moral philosophy. What is moral philosophy? It is the description of how the human being achieves the good as opposed to the true. OK, and you achieve the good by acting. And you have to act in a certain way, and that's called morality, and that will guarantee that you achieve the good. Well, he just banned uh, economics from its proper matrix, namely moral philosophy, and moved it in, turned it into a kind of physics, and it has had a ca catastrophic effect on economics ever since, ever since. Because ever since, economists t t are trying, pretending that they're physicists, and they're not. Uh, and what, you, what you have here is basically economists pretending that we're still living in 1850 and the physics of 1850 is still a, a valid guide to how to run the economic system. This was preposterous. It led to one catastrophe after another. And the most prominent, of course, which I discuss in my book, is the Irish potato famine. It was immoral. The people like uh, uh, Senior, uh, the, the economist, felt that it was immoral for you to send aid to the starving Irish because you're intervening in this perfect system. The market will achieve equilibrium, just let market forces prevail and everything will work out fine. In our day, we have 
uh, double agents like Father Robert Sirica, head of the Acton Institute, uh, pretending to be a Catholic priest. He wears the Roman collar uh, and all the while uh, using that Roman collar to subvert Catholic social teaching, which is based on the principle that, no, no, this is moral behavior. In order to achieve a just economy, you have to behave in a moral fashion because the basis of the economy is not uh, little particles bumping into each other or planets, you know, circling or going around in their orbits. It's basically two people and one person has something to sell and the other person wants to buy. And these people have to come to some type of just and equitable agreement. That's the center of every economy. And that's a moral uh, operation because in that uh, equation, the strong man will always be tempted to take advantage of the weak. And of course, the, the, the usual way that the strong take advantage of, of the weak is by lending them money and engaging in usury, which becomes the other force uh, other than labor. So back to Adam Smith, he creates a system called, it's called laissez-faire, which he got from the physiocrats because he went to France as a tutor for one of the rich aristocrats who was paying his bills at the time and uh, basically adopted the idea of laissez-faire, which is basically just leave it alone. Leave everything alone. Everything will come out fine. Well, guess what? Everything does not come out fine. And if you leave it alone, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, which is the world we live in today. Because what you're leaving alone primarily is usury, and usury always concentrates wealth into fewer and fewer hands. And that is, the, as I said, the world we live in today. So Adam Smith, Adam Smith is a Scotsman. He was, uh, if, 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 if the, the Whigs, uh, who oligarchs who conquered Scotland after the Jacobite rising of 1745, had a unique way of uh, uh, rubbing the noses of the people they defeated in their defeat. And that was by taking their children and bringing them to Cambridge and Oxford as uh, giving them scholarships. <laughs> in our day, in our day it's, we have things like the Rhodes Scholarship, mm -hmm. which uh, is there to anoint uh, the lackeys of the oligarchs. Uh, Bill Clinton is a Rhodes Scholar. He, it, this certifies that you are a dependable lackey for the oligarchs who run the Anglo-American empire. The mayor of South Bend, Indiana, our, our homosexual mayor, is also a Rhodes Scholarship, and he's proving himself to be a loyal lackey of the oligarchs uh, here. This situation, this uh, institution started after the Jacobite rising, in, of 1745, and Adam Smith was one of the first people to become involved in it. He went to uh, Oxford. He hated Oxford. He was there in Oxford when Bonnie Prince Charlie was marching on, on, um, on London. Almost succeeded in overthrowing the the oligarchy. Uh, his friend uh, David Hume was also a Scot and also involved in the same type of project. The interesting thing about this is uh, they were both, neither one knew his father. This is kind of like a characteristic. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, never knew his father. They looked for people, they looked for fatherless people because then the Whig oligarch becomes their uh, surrogate father. And basically they're just, for, they're docile servants of the empire. Hume, uh, Talk, Hume uh, never got rid of his Scottish accent, unlike Adam Smith, who one of, one of Adam Smith's jobs was to teach Scots, Scotsmen how to speak like Englishmen. <laughs> he, had, he had accomplished that himself. David Hume could never do that. He just he, he ended up going being in France, uh, being a diplomat, but he never got uh, over his uh, basically Scottish accent. He sounded like Shrek when he talked. <laughs> but... Um, he took the principles, uh, what he did was take the principles of empiricism to the logical conclusion, which is basically you can't know anything. Complete skepticism. Hume was a complete skeptic. And at this point, English philosophy ran into the ground, not just English philosophy, but with Newton, basically the English had taken over European philosophy and they become the avant-garde 
Uh, and that that was called science, and everybody was in awe of science. But Hume took the philosophical tradition to its to let me say, Hume took British empiricism to its logical conclusion, which basically you can't know anything, and you don't even know if you're there to know anything. You, how do you know that you are you? How do you know there's any continuity between the person who's talking now and the person who was on your show last a week ago? Because it, it, there's there's no evidence. There's no evidence of causality. Causality is just something that you see because it's like causality is what we would call post hoc ergo propter hoc. This spread throughout the, the uh, throughout Europe, and it had an absolutely devastating effect on uh, basically the German, uh, the the uh, continental tradition. And the man who uh, was affected keenly by this was Immanuel Kant who read uh, Hume's book, and it led to a crisis, okay? Maybe we can, though. Maybe it's all just... So Kant read the book, uh, read Hume, and for 11 years, he did nothing but meditate on Hume, and finally, he came up with the solution to this problem, and it was called the synthetic a priori, and in this, Kant said that knowledge could... A statement could be both true and real at the same time. It was... Uh, Hume said it could be true or false or real or unreal, but it could, uh, real, but it couldn't be both. Kant said no, it can be both. The synthetic or, or a priori proves that. And with this stroke, Kant resurrected logos in Europe, and it led to the probably the greatest period of German thought in the history of that country, even though it wasn't a country at this point. The Germanic principalities. This was Prussia. Prussia became an incredibly powerful entity uh, because suddenly they had a, a foundation, a firm foundation, a metaphysical foundation. You could make statements that were real. He rehabilitated reason and logos, and uh, immediately had followers like Fichte, who uh, who was his disciple. Actually, went and met with him. Uh, wrote books in the style of Kant, and then Fichte, uh, like Adam Smith, came up with the uh, the economic implications of what Kant was saying. And the economic implications—it's a book that's never been translated into English, *De uh, Geschlossene Handelsstadt*. And basically, he came up with the idea of the state, and this is the antithesis of England. England is a sea power. The image uh, of England is Leviathan. Hobbes wrote a book called Leviathan. And what is Leviathan? Leviathan's a sea monster. And the Leviathan is the, the British Navy. Uh, Britannia rules the waves. What this means, in effect, is uh, if we lend money to the uh, key dive of Egypt, and he doesn't pay. We send the Navy in and they bomb the hell out of uh, Alexandria. And that's the end of the story. And that's basically what the British Navy was. And this is the sea power. And Fichte came up with the opposite of this, which is basically the land power and the state. And he says you have to close the borders of the state before you have a state. Now, remember, Fichte is writing at a time when there is no German state. There is Prussia. There are all these little principalities. And the simple fact of the matter is that Germany is being held back because it's got too many countries, too little, all these little countries, and none of them are really economically viable except for uh, Prussia and Bavaria. So this inspires, you have to close off the border, you have to concentrate the labor within the state. And the state has a responsibility to the citizens to give them work. And what you see here is basically Germany drawing on its deepest tradition, which is basically the understanding that labor is the source of all value. They got this idea from the Benedictine monks who came to Germany after the collapse of the Roman Empire and basically taught the Germans how to work. This is what I've said. Uh, uh, I was in Tehran giving a talk uh, on television. I said that the, the Iranians were philosophers and astronomers when my ancestors were chasing pigs through the forest of Germany. 
And the only reason they're still not chasing pigs through the forest of Germany is because of the Benedictine monks who taught them how to work. Let me just fast forward at this point to the Nereri book. Because it has bearing on the Nereri book. The Broken also, Pump in Tanzania, right? Yeah, the Broken Pump in Tanzania. Because I went to Tanzania and that was my epiphany. It's like my version of the heart of darkness. You know, like instead of Marlowe going up the Congo, I go to Lake Victoria, cross Lake Victoria, come to the I socialist village, Kamuga, and the center of it is a broken pump. And the pump's been broken for 30 years. Why is the pump broken? I ended up meeting the governor of the Mara State. And the first thing I said, it's just coincidence. He's there with his Land Rover with the flags flying on the bumper. And I said, yeah, the pump in Kamuga is broken. And he looks at me like, how does this Mzungu know that the pump's broken? And then he says to me, it's broken everywhere. Now, why is the pump broken in Kamuga uh, uh, and all, every, every place in Mara State in Tanzania? Well, it goes back to what I said about labor. After doing the research, what I was doing on this book, I met a German lady who gave me a pamphlet put out by the Diocese of Würzburg in Germany. And Würzburg has a partnership with uh, the Diocese of Mbinga, which is just south of the Diocese of Musoma, whose bishop had invited me to come to do research on Julius Nerera. So the bro brochure opens up. You open up one page. One page is... There's the Diocese of Würzburg, and there's the Diocese of Mbinga. Diocese of Mbinga, founded 1989, 87, something like that, somewhere time in the 80s. Diocese of Würzburg. When was the Diocese of Würzburg founded? Oh, um, I think you asked me this before, so I know. It's the 7th seventh, uh, century, 80? 8th century. 8th century. century, okay. So, <laughs> eighth century. So here we are. This is, this is the crucial difference. So I'm saying, why is Tanzania, why is the pump broken in Tanzania? Well, imagine what would have happened if the German, the Benedictine monks came to Germany in 742 and they left in 782. And that's pretty much what you have in a, a country like Tanzania. The missionaries left. And they left because, before uh, they taught the Tanzanians how to work. I hope I don't get in trouble by saying that. But basically, that's the difference between Germany and Tanzania. You had the German bishop, the Benedictines living there. Fichte understood this. And Fichte create, said you have to concentrate the labor here by putting borders around the state. This is obviously an issue in our time. The biggest issue probably in the Trump campaign was the border. We don't have borders. We have borders that are enforced in the interest of rich people who want cheap labor, which means we don't have borders. We don't have effective borders. Fichte said you have to establish borders. And the one man who understood this was Friedrich List. Now, if you talk to the typical Anglophone, the man who speaks English, and you say, who is Friedrich List? He'll probably tell you it's a, he's a Hungarian pianist. <laughs> He was not a Hungarian pianist. He was the man who created Germany. He started off uh, in the in the aftermath of the Napole Napoleonic Wars, when Germany, Prussia was so grateful to the English for the help in defeating Napoleon, they opened their borders and immediately a, a, a flood of cheap manufactured goods flooded into Germany and wrecked their economy, basically wrecked their economy. And the man who learned this lesson was List, who proposed what came to be known as the Zollverein or the customs union, which is basically the problem with Germany, he said, is you got all these little principalities and they all charge tariffs on each other. So you, 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 to, to sail down the Rhine, you have to pay tariffs to robber barons every 15 miles, which means you're never going to be able to produce anything effectively. So what he persuaded the Germans to do, inspired by Fichte, abolish the internal tariffs and set up an external tariff. Uh, this in combination with the rail, railway led to the unification of Germany 19, in 1871. And once Germany unified and concentrated its labor force, the economy took off. The first thing that happened was the Germans stopped emigrating to places like the United States. I'm an American because my German ancestors couldn't make any money over there because they were living uh, before the unification. As soon as the unification took place, 
you had a crisis, of course, the Kulturkampf, where Bismarck started persecuting the Catholic Church. Bismarck was a, an intelligent politician who realized at a certain point that the Catholics were not his enemy, the Marxists were his enemy, and he eventually listened to Bishop von Kettler, who said, you have to preserve labor, and he instituted Social Security and health care, and at that point, the P Germans stopped emigrating. They concentrated that labor force, and by 1910, England, had, or I'm sorry, Germany had surpassed England as the most productive economy in the world. At that point, uh, heroes, American heroes like Winston Churchill took notice and he and Lord Grey then conspired to lead Germany into a war, which they succeeded in doing. There was a second world war called World War II. And at that point, Germany was completely crushed, unconditional surrender, and they were subjected to a ruthless form of social engineering, which basically induced the Germans to internalize the commands of their oppressors, which they have done better than any nation on earth. It's the most politically correct country in the world. And that's why nobody knows what I'm talking about. That's <laughs> why no one knows. That's why everyone I'm talking to will say, oh, yeah, Friedrich List, he's a Hungarian pianist. Because the victors write history and basically economic history has been written by the victors who uh, impose their system now on the rest of the world. So that's the short summary. That's the elevator speech for <laughs> Baron Metal. <laughs> I hope it's a very tall building, right? <laughs> yeah. <it was> a... <laughs> uh, no, it's great. That's a great summation. I mean, you're talking about a 1,400-page book, but yeah. So it's a great summation of the uh, basic theme of the book, uh, labor versus usury. And the usury is the British Anglo-American power's labor is German power, hence we get the 20th century. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the 18th, unification in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War. <clears throat> and German... Uh, Germany's meteoric rise, which threatens to uh, uh, undermine uh, British hegemony. Yeah, the biggest the biggest mistake the Kaiser made was starting to build battleships. Never should have built battleships mm -hmm. because he challenged Britannia's rule of the waves. And that was really more so than even the economy. That was what got Churchill and Lord Grey to, to conspire to get uh, Germany into a war. Germany is... This this is, uh, as you you mentioned earlier, this was the thesis of Halford McKinder, basically said there are two, there are the Ocean, the uh, island nations, which is basically England and it's Amer America, Canada, Australia, the colonies, uh, and there are there is the Eurasian landmass. And the whole, whole purpose of Anglo-American foreign policy is to divide the Eurasian landmass so that they could not sustain themselves. And this is precisely what happened to Germany because it did not ally itself with Russia during World War I. The result of this, Germany, is, Ger Germany cannot feed itself. Okay, It just simply does not have the, the uh, land mass to feed a population as big as it is. Churchill knew this, and so he brought Leviathan into play here. Uh, the Germans signed an armistice and perfidious Albion then did not lift the naval blockade and 100,000 Germans starved to death because the English would not let the food in. At this point, this, this made a big impression on a corporal from <laughs> Austria by the name of Adolf Hitler. And he vowed this would never happen again. And so the first thing he did, or the second thing or third thing he did, was basically invade uh, Russia so that he could get um, the Ukraine and its agricultural resources. Uh, he was, this was Lebensraum, right? Yeah, uh, or Drang nach Osten, auch. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, we need that uh, to base that those, that bread basket in order to, to feed the German people so that England cannot starve us to death again, which is what they did uh, uh, after World War I. A, a completely heinous act on the part of Churchill, whose life was nothing but hein one heinous act after another. So he outdid himself with this when he starved the Germans, and the, the result was the rise of Hitler and World War II. The um, interesting point regarding Britain, British uh, strategizing or, or fomenting a war with Germany in the early 20th century, uh, in your book, um, page 1209, you write, the war with Germany was a war for trade, as Balfour 
made clear when he said, We are probably fools not to find a reason for declaring war on Germany before she builds too many ships and takes away our trade. When someone countered Balfour's assertion by saying, If you wish to compete with German trade, work harder. Balfour could only uh, counter uh, fatalistically. That would mean lowering our living standard. Perhaps it would be simpler for us to have a war. It is a question of, it is, it is a question of right or wrong? Maybe it is just a question of keeping our supremacy. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, he couldn't compete uh, uh, economically. So there goes your free trade argument for the British, right? So <laughs> yeah, so it exposes British hypocrisy here. Yeah. You know, and no, no we're, it, free trade is not free. It's not just this, this Newtonian system that functions perfectly on its own. No, no. It's basically imposed by military force. Mm-hmm. And that's the lesson the Americans learned as the heirs of the British. And that's why Churchill was an advocate of a, of a modernized larger navy, because uh, he uh, basically the navy was there to in, enforce, uh, well, as you I said earlier, to, to more or less be a, a muscle man or bill collector for, for, the, uh, for the money right. lenders. Yeah. Right. And, and he made that fateful decision to convert the British Navy from coal to oil, which meant he needed the Middle East as the main source of oil and he needed a beachhead. And guess who the beachhead was in the Middle East? <laughs> Israel. Yeah. And so he was a, 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 a Churchill was in the pocket of the Jews for his entire life before his life, because his father ended died. Uh, 80,000 pounds in debt to Natty Rothschild. Mm-hmm. So his family was in the in the pocket of the Jews, uh, you know, for at least two generations. And that goes back to the higher, like the entire British ruling class, because when they took all the land, they were cash poor and they borrowed m- money. And eventually they had to sell off their properties to make the interest payments, correct? That's right. That's exact. That's the story of the 19th century in England. Uh, basically, you had this landed aristocracy that was rich, uh, land rich from the theft of church property uh, f- during the Reformation. After the Nap- Napoleonic Wars, they, they felt they ruled the world and they wanted to look as if they ruled the world. And they wanted these big, uh, you know, country estates, country houses. And so they'd go to the Jews, uh, the Rothschild, Nathan Rothschild in particular, and borrow money and use the land as collateral. Well, guess what happened over the course of the 19th century? The English ruling class lost their property to the Jews. That's the story of English aristocracy in a nutshell. And the Churchill family is probably the best example of that. Uh, and Winston Churchill himself is a, a prime example of uh, a, a family st- struggling to hold on to this image of themselves as the landed aristocracy by hook or by crook. To show you how desperate they were, they even went to America to find rich American wives uh, like uh, Winston Churchill's mother, uh, the famous Jenny. Uh, and uh, even that wouldn't work because nothing works Nothing is power more powerful than compound interest mm-hmm. over the long haul. It will destroy any source of income whatsoever. And, and that's what happened. The, the only reason Churchill lasts is because uh, some rich Jew would step in and bail him out at certain crucial periods in his life. David Irving brought this up with Dave, is the one who broke the story about uh, Lord Strakosh bailing Churchill out in the 1930s. But it happened before that as well. And this was uh, when, when Churchill sort of changed his tune regarding Hitler in Germany. He became a uh, vocal opponent or advocate of war against Germany just when he was getting money from these uh, from his from his uh, you know, Jewish creditors, I guess, right? Yeah. Well, he also changed his tune on Bolshevism in 1919. He wrote Bolshevism as a Jewish phenomenon. Well, that that didn't go anywhere because he needed he needed the Jews to roll over his loans. Mm-hmm. Oh, and you're not going to do that by selling, telling the world, by spilling the beans, let's say, and tell, well, it's all Jews over there. They're Bolsheviks. They're all Jews. No, so, it didn't work. So he had to constantly trim his sales so that the Jews would roll over his loans. And again, another example of that would be the, the Suez Canal when Rothschild pretty much took over the British state. When I guess Disraeli was prime minister at the time. but um, So he could collect on uh, some bad loans, right? <laughs> The Egyptian yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I, I mentioned this, the Palmerston or the, the Don Pacifico affair. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which was basically some some guy lent the Greek king money, and the the, uh, the the Greeks wouldn't repay it, and so the guy suddenly decided he was a British citizen, and he got uh, Lord Palmerston to send the British Navy into Piraeus and threatened to blow the place up, and at that point the uh, the Greeks capitulated and paid the paid the Jew off. But um, and th- this is roughly the same time as the Irish potato famine, right? That's right. That's right. Palmerston is a, a completely sinister figure because at the same time he's doing this, he's shipping his starving Irish tenants off to Canada to starve. To, if they didn't starve to death on the way over, they froze to death when they crawled off the ship naked at Gros Isle in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. So a completely reprehensible thug in the English manner, and gave this speech uh, in before Parliament, after he got caught in the Palmerston affair, and uh, he said basically, the proudest boast of any Roman was, he was Romana Sum, and now we can say that, I'm a British citizen, and that gives us, <laughs> basic, he, he was Romana Sum, uh, is basically what, what, uh, McGeorge Bundy had in mind when Kennedy came to him in the airplane. Kennedy, when he's flying to Berlin, he says to uh, McGeorge Bundy, I want to say Kiwis Romana Sum in German. You're a genius. You went to Harvard. You're a whiz kid. And so uh, uh, McGeorge Bundy came up with the famous line, Ich bin ein Berliner, which the German, they were too polite to say it, but basically it means I'm a jelly donut. Because uh, you Germans would not say that. Germans, if 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 McGeorge Bundy actually knew German, he would say what Kennedy should have said was, "Ich bin auch Berliner. I'm a I'm a citizen of Berlin too." You don't use the article when you do it this way. But they didn't know that anyway. That's all. It could also go back to Kiwis Romana Sum and the English who thought they were the successors of the Roman Empire, and basically they had a free pass to basically uh, collect debts or bomb the hell out of your uh, your city. Acting like, Humburg, pa- acting like pagans again. Yeah. Hamburg yeah. was always uh, a British outpost in uh, in Germany. They were never supportive of the Zollverein and List because they knew the British Navy could sail right up that river and bomb the hell out of the place. And in half an hour, uh, a thousand years of work would have gone down the drain. Mm-hmm. And that's, get, that's the story of the British Navy. They had to wait to 1943 for that. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, interesting side story. I had a friend who went to Germany, I guess it was the uh, early 90s, and he brought back as a souvenir for me was a little uh, a fake jelly donut. If you press it, it said Eichmann in Berliner. <laughs> <laughs> so Germans never Dumme, forgot that. <laughs> Dumme, die dumme Amis. Die dumme Amis. They, they can't even speak German, yet they're all... But anyway, they're so polite, and they love Kennedy, so it's become a, a legend, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Jelly donut. It's very funny. Um, oh, yeah. Now, one thing you were talking about, um, oh, yeah, the uh, the British philo-Semitism, which is which the origins of it may be philosophical, but it dates way back to Cromwell, uh, at least that far. But, uh, but also to this, um, well, because the, the issue of usury, because in your book, you also write that one of the problems underlying the British potato fan wasn't just a strange fungus. It was the economic conditions, the, the agrarian policy, land policies in Ireland, which aggravated the situation, denied Irish other food sources. So uh, basically they were, they were forced off the property and forced to rely on potatoes, which, um, which failed, the crop failed. But the pressure that the, uh, la- that the absentee landlords were financially to their creditors led to the much of the um, neglect of the Irish, correct? Yeah, they had, to, they had to grind the Irish because they were in debt to the Jews. Mm-hmm. Palmerston's the classic example of that. Why do you think Palmerston went for the Don Pacifico affair? He needed the Jews to roll over his loans. It's that simple. And, and, and he had to grind the, the Irish worker because, because of usury, because he was up to his eyeballs in debt mm-hmm. and he was going to lose all his property. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing uh, is another in this time uh, you write about that has a huge significance in the 20th century is the great rapprochement, these, uh, the the union between the United States and Great Britain. Worst thing that ever happened yes. to the United States. Now, this was largely achieved because well, one thing is the East, East Coast elite were always Anglophile, but the most of the country wasn't. They're very skeptical. You know, Germans, Irish, Poles, whatever, particularly Irish and Germans. But um, 
which made up really the majority of the country uh, uh, collectively. But um, what happened? Uh, you, this also coincides with, like the the Rhodes Trust and uh, uh, Mil- Lord Milner and sort of the, this great cultural agenda that, that was played out in the late nineteenth century. Yeah. To I'm sorry, me, I have I have to. Oh yeah, okay. So we're back. The Great Reproach Month. This was the one of the I guess most uh, important uh, accomplishments of British uh, foreign policy you know, in its history, perhaps even in the twentieth century at least. The, actually, it actually goes back to the 19th century. Okay. The, the end of the 19th century, what, with, with the rise of uh, racism, um, yeah, yeah, basically the ruling class in the United States felt they had more in common with the ruling class in England than they had with their own fellow citizens of the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, this is a time when uh, Madison Grant one of the great racial theorists uh, said that uh, there were three races in Europe. I, I always this is ironic because the white guys are always citing Madison Grant. Well, if there's one thing Madison Grant didn't believe in, he didn't believe in white guys. He said there was the Alpine race, the uh, the Mediterranean race, and the Anglo-Saxon or Teutonic race. And it was only the Teutonic group that he was going to interested in allowing into uh, the United States. His great triumph was the Immigration Act of the 1924, which basically excluded uh, Catholics. Let's put it let's put it bluntly: Poles, Italians, people like that, mm-hmm. uh, Catholic Germans. Uh, to the, and and the tragedy here was that you had this tremendous violation of the idea of the nation, uh, because the English, the oligarchs, are always. Internationalist, and of course, who are the prime internationalists in the world? <laughs> Go ahead, say it. No, say it. It's say like it. Cosmopolitan Jews, the rootless cosmopolites that uh, Stalin talked about. Mm. The, the people, with no nation. They certainly had no nation at that point, and so they hated any type of of uh, nationalism, and they still hate every type of nationalism except their own. own national Jews uh, like Trotsky who hated uh, was a communist because he hated all forms of nationalism so had this violation of national consciousness uh, because the American ruling class felt that they had more in common with people like Winston Churchill than a, a, an Italian on the lower east side of New York mm-hmm. <coughs> uh, which Madison Grant would have referred to as another race an inferior race. <coughs> so there is a complete repudiation of everything that people like Friedrich List uh, did uh, with the collaboration of the Carey brothers and uh, people, the people, the uh, the uh, protectionists in the United States, who erected tariff barriers to create what was one of the greatest industrial infrastructures in the world. Uh, so you know, American history has always been a battle between the uh, the nationalist and the internationalist. To this day, isn't it? Yeah. That's the big the big thing that got elected, whether you believed it or not, was the evocation of America first, which was basically the in, the the defeated American nationalists. Uh, the Henry Ford, uh, Charles Cochran, uh, Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, the people who wanted to keep uh, the United States out of World War II. That, that group of people was defeated uh, by the internationalists, largely the Rockefellers, who were using their uh, British, uh, the Rockefeller Center as a headquarters for British agents. Uh, and those people were completely obliterated. I know... Uh, Henry Regnery, the publisher, was a friend of mine when he was alive, and he told me that uh, his family, his father was a big uh, supporter of America First from Chicago. Henry Regnery told me that the day after Pearl Harbor, the FBI showed up and stole America First mailing list, just demanded the mailing list, and that obliterated America First. And what we got instead was this thing called conservatism which is basically uh, trying to channel that force into something that's congenial to America as the world empire. And so we've never, Trump evoked 
or Steve Bannon or whoever it was, evoked America first and got himself elected. Well, that's because there's still a, a large group of people here who feel strongly about this, feel that we need that all these foreign wars are being prosecuted at the expense of American prosperity. Uh, so it's still there. It's still there. And the great rapprochement was basically what wrecked it uh, for the United States, got America involved in World War One, World War Two, and then put them on the road to where they are now. The cop, the world's cop, the American empire aspires to rule the world. And they're they're willing to go. I mean, there's certain segments who are willing to go whole hog nuclear war with Russia, whatever it takes, you know, so it hasn't gone away. In in the, uh, in this part of the book, you mentioned uh, Guido Preparata, or Preparata calls us the clubs. By clubs and elites, I mean the established and self-perpetuating fraternities that ruled the Anglo-Saxon commonwealths. These were and still are f formed by the aggregation of dynasts issued from the banking houses, the diplomatic corps, corps the officer caste, and the executive aristocracy, which still remain solid, solidly entrenched in the constitutional fabric of the modern democracies. These clubs act, rule, breed, and think of like a compact uh, oligarchy and co-opt the middle class to use it as a filter between themselves and their cannon fodder, the commoners. In the 20th and early 21st centuries, it is the Anglo-American clubs that have carried the day, and their tenure has little to do with human rights, free markets, and democracy, regardless of what they may shamelessly say. Now, <laughs> that was a well-chosen uh, quote you put in your book. <laughs> yeah, that's Guido Preparato's book, yeah. Yeah, about Hitler. About Hitler. Mm -hmm. That's right. And he's, he's right. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, the metaphor for American society is the Masonic Lodge. Uh, there were actual Masonic lodges that had actual political power. They, they very powerful group in the United States. Uh, the populace became aware of it in the early or uh, mid nineteenth uh, century. There were actually anti Masonic parties uh, in the United States, but it continued. Their clubs. He's right. I mean, the cl classic example of this was the election where we had to choose between George W. Bush and John Kerry who happened to be both members of the same secret society called Skull and Bones. You know, this is Harvard, Yale are places where these clubs exist. So when you, as my son, my son went to Harvard, uh, this is a tryout to get in the club. The club was the Porcelli and my son did not get, this probably sounded like sour grapes on my part, but my son did not get into Porcelli because he gave the wrong answer when they asked him what he thought of Darwin, which is one of the <laughs> pillars of the book ideology you know so but i mean so pete Buttigieg, bill clinton they're they're pe people who gave the right answers they got into the club the Rhodes uh, scholarship the skull and bones whatever rule these are the oligarchs these are the these are the people who do the bidding of the oligarchs and impose oligarchic control over the rest of us now um you also, in the book, you have a, a piece, uh, David Wemhoff, uh, this is on page 1309, uh, talking about the uh, Americans' decision to uh, pretty much t pick up the mantle of the British Empire after the Second World War. And um, it's a great summation of exactly what is the agenda of the uh, American Empire just after the Second World War. Uh, he writes, uh, Wemhoff then explains, or you write, the Wemhoff then explains the ramifications of America's decision to embark on the path of economic warfare. This is uh, in the late 40s. In addition to psychological warfare, C.D.'s efforts, this is C.D. Jackson, C.D. Jackson's efforts were not surprisingly in the area of economics, particularly in the development of American world economic plan or system. If the media was the means, the, then economics was the reason, and C.D. was, a, was conversant and influential in both, both arenas. To that end, he was also a part of the World Trade Foundation, which intensified the movement to globalize America's international business interest. He was a key organizer of the Bilderberg Group that first met in 1954. CD saw that the one thing that private enterprise cannot do abroad is to create a favorable climate for U.S. investment. That's, jo that's the job for the U.S. government, and that's a job that is today uh, honor-bound to do. Like Luce and Kennan, CD knew that the consumer demands had to be increased, and the world standard of living raised to solve the problem stimulating demand. Therefore, getting American business, hence American banking, and the capitalist spirit stretching around the globe, C.D. wrote that there was there are 2 billion people on this globe, and 50% of them have a sub-marginal standard of living. And therefore, to increase that living standard by a fraction of, of a percent, 
create a demand for a production that would exceed all current capacity in the West. It was a new frontier that puts all previous frontiers in the shade, in that it consisted of pocket rate radios, telephones, this is consumerism, television, washers, dryers, blue jeans, plastics galore, new roads, new shopping centers, new communities and of, of small prefab, endless desire, endless demand, endless growth. The Americanization of the world, it was unlimited. This was to CD the frontier of the minds, the hearts, and the lives of two billion people who inhabit the world. The enterprise America and meant liberation as well as infinite opportunity and limited psychological warfare. <laughs> so, um, that was it. I mean, that's pretty much encompasses the sort of the full spectrum dominance of, of this uh, uh, empire, I guess. That nothing is outside its its purview because it has to. America is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, loose, loose express, loose. Uh, Henry Luce was uh, basically employed C.D. Jackson at Time Life as his kind of right-hand man. But C.D. Jackson was also an employee of the CIA. And at this point in history, Time Magazine is the American Propaganda Ministry. Uh, it pretty much did what the CIA wanted it to do. And uh, Luce, during World War II, came up with the American proposition uh, and uh, basically said America is a commercial republic. Which is, I, I think he's right. I think that's all this country will ever be. We just, I just read an article where there's some professor at the University of Virginia agonizing over the curriculum. Well, forget it, buddy. You know, I mean, I've reached an age where I realize I, you can agonize all you want. America is a commercial republic. And they, it, all this type of stuff about Plato and the great books, it's all window dressing. It's all just business. And this is see, I, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to expand on this idea. It is what it is. I'm a great believer in Hegel's idea of the de list de vernunft, the cunning of reason. America has created a world language, English. Uh, the language basically allows us to say, "How much does that cost?" I'll take <laughs> ten. And above that, you're in trouble. And that's the problem with the world right now. You know, if it's anything more complicated than how much does it cost and I'll take 10, then we have to send in the army to resolve this issue because we can't adjudicate. But I'm saying that the cunning of reason allows, created that language. Language is logos. There's no question about that. But it allows us now a higher logos, which I'm trying to sell being the good american salesman right <laughs> i'm trying to sell this to the islamic world i'm trying to sell it to the iranians getting mixed reviews here uh but basically the iranians come to me when i was in tehran the last time and said that we'd like to collaborate a delegation from the university came so i said sure let's create philosophy Let's create philosophy in the recreate philosophy in the islamic world after the thousand year collapse after the thousand year slumber that began when uh, Ibn Rushd couldn't resolve the Quran or Aristotle. Let's do it now. Now, the jury is still out on this thing, but I'm saying that's what needs to be done. And it may be that the American empire will provide a way to that, but in spite of itself, because God is in charge of history, not Harry Luce or C.D. Jackson. And that's my, that's my latest proposal. And not Henry Kissinger or Brzezinski, thank God. No. <laughs> um, yeah, you talk about this. Um, well, socialism and liberalism being part of a dialectic. Um, you write socialism is not the antidote to liberalism, nor is the more commonly supposed in the period following 1989 is liberalism the antidote to socialism, because between the two, there is no basic difference in principle. Taken together, liberalism and socialism create a dialectic according to which each keeps the other in power in at least a cyclical fashion. It is pointless to expect the representatives of liberalism to preserve the integrity of the state because they share the same antipathy to the Christian social order that revolutionaries abhor, or harbor, rather, abhor. Therefore, Heinrich Petsch, Heinrich Petsch concludes, whoever, warns, whoever wants to combat socialism effectively should direct the attacks against liberalism. Socialism will finally be vanquished, not as socialism itself, but as it is, it is incorporated in and together with liberalism. So you yes. see, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, a good, uh, again, to get back to my most recent book on Julius Nerera, mm -hmm. Tanzania is like the classic example of this. Tanzania was a colony, actually wasn't a colony, it was a protectorate, 
which is a little bit different than a colony. But anyway, they gain independence. And because of his training at Edinburgh University, uh, Adam Smith's alma mater, uh, he imposed what he called Ujamaa, or African socialism, on Tanzania. The, I have a friend uh, who taught in Kenya for years, and he met a Polish priest over there, and he said, the only thing worse than socialism is African socialism. <laughs> and Tanzania was proof of that. The, he imposed basically a system that was doomed to failure because it violated the principle of subsidiarity. Now, Nerera was a Catholic. Uh, not only that, the Bishop of Mosoma is proposing him for canonization. Uh, but he did not, he didn't, he didn't have any Catholic principles backing up his economic system. If he had read Quadragesimo Anno, which was the most recent statement of Catholic social teaching, Nerere would have known that you have to have subsidiarity. You can't have the higher do for the lower what the lower can do for itself. And so you had one food company in Tanzania, which allowed the creation of a nomenclatura, a corrupt uh, ruling class elite that basically used it as a, a form of extorting bribes from people. What do you expect? And of course, that led to uh, a, an unsustainable system. And at that point, the repressed returns. McNamara, Robert McNamara leaves the World Bank. The new guy comes in and imposes the the orthodoxy of Milton Friedman on the rest of the world. And they cut off the aid, and now they're just predatory lending, and the result is privatization, and Tanzania goes into international debt. That was true for the entire world. So you see the, ba the basic cycle. Nareri became a socialist because socialism was the orthodoxy in England at that time. That was because of John Maynard Keynes, who had to pick up the pieces after capitalism collapsed in 1929. It failed. It failed. It always fails because capitalism is state-sponsored usury. And usury always leads to unrepayable debt and collapses the economy. Always happens. That's the, basically the story of my book. Okay? So this is the dialectic that went back and forth and back and forth. And that's what led to the collapse of development in, in places like East Africa. We're still living in the same situation. Now, you, uh, you mentioned, well, first with German idealism, um, uh, you write that situated firmly uh, in the German idealist tradition of economic thought created by Fichte, Mueller, List, and Kettler, and Petsch, brought to that body of thought an understanding of the moral underpinnings of economic life that had been previously lacking. Petsch and Kettler administered the coup de grace to Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment by showing that self-interest cannot serve as the basis of economic life. This is the idea that we're moral... moral Moral, moral morality was banished from economics with with Newton when he proposed that it was it was like physics, um, where prior to Newton economics was a subset of morality. After Newton, that uh, 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 economics became, or morality became a subset of economics. They were switched around. Um, but you're saying what I, what German idealism does it it it's a re uh, injection of the notion of morality in economic affairs. Now, now that's we're to, no. I, I, that would be going too far. Okay. The, the reinjection of morality came with Bishop von Kettler. Okay. His book uh, Das Christentum und die Arbeiterfrage came out in the same year as Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Okay, and it was at this point uh, Pesch sees the 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 the, the, tre the, the, the really tremendously deleterious effect that capitalism is having on the German worker, because these are the people in Mainz who are his parishioners. These are his flock. And they're being ground into dust because of one simple thing called the iron law of wages, which is basically you can treat labor like any other commodity and just drive the price down until the point where, which they reached in Germany, where the, the standard wage was not enough to sustain a working man, and most principally, a working man as the father and head of a family. This is precisely what happened in Florence under the Medici's. They drove the wages down to the point where the working man could not support a family. When this happens, that's the end of the workforce, because guess what? If you can't have children, there's no future. And if there's no future, there are no workers. 
And so by the by the by the beginning of the 16th century, Florence was the museum that it is today. It stopped being the economic powerhouse that it was in the 15th century. It became the museum it is today because they basically they basically uh, destroyed their own workforce. And they got into banking. They got out of cloth manufacturing and got into banking. And that's the story of every single country uh, that has gone down this road since that time. Holland, uh, England, America. That's when you were reading that uh, C.D. Jackson passage about America selling washing machines. I felt myself thinking this feeling of nostalgia came (laughs) over. What, What a great place America was when it was actually producing washing machines. You can export, you know? yeah. You know, what are we producing now? Well, uh, collateralized debt obligations. Did you see the big short? Okay, yeah. this uh, like uh, Goldman Sachs selling crap, uh, junk, junk, uh, uh, whatever they're called, uh, financial instruments to the Germans because the Jews want to stick it to the Germans. This is the world that we live in now. I mean, what a great world America was when we actually produced something. Lori Blankfein doing God's work, right? Yeah, <laughs> Lori Blankfein, you know, the supporter of sodomy and usury, mm-hmm. you know, because that's the new system. It shows you how predatory, how predatory the system has become in a relatively short period of time. Let's say after World War II, when the when let's take the the benchmark when Henry Ford the the second Henry the Deuce, as they call him at Ford, signed an agreement with the UAW, ended the, his his uh, his grandfather's predatory attitude toward labor. And not pred- I mean Henry Ford is a great American hero, but he didn't understand that unions are necessary to keep the labor force intact, you know. And uh, that so let's take his grandson's deal sits down with the UAW and we have this moment of prosperity that lasted up until uh, 1973 or let's say 79 when Paul Folker becomes head of the Fed uh, and sets out to destroy the economy in the interest of drive, uh, destroying inflation, driving down inflation. In the name of destroying, yeah, to uh, protect the creditors. He used- protect the creditors yeah. against the workers. Yeah. Against the majority, the overwhelming majority of people are debtors, not creditors. And so this is Paul Folker is one of the great villains of American history, along with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and Milton Friedman. Margaret Thatcher was not an American, but I mean, you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, again, this uh, get in your book about how the politics was manipulated at the time. First thing with the social issues, particularly you got all these Catholics, traditional Democrats going over to Reagan because of the abortion issue. Absolutely. Yeah. And they voted against their own self-interest and Reagan exploited them mercilessly, dangled out the abortion issue in front of them, lured them into a situation where they got trapped into voting against their own self-interest. First thing Reagan ever does when he gets into office is attack the tra- air control or traffic controllers union. Attack the unions. The unions are the villains. Labor is the villain. If labor is the villain, then usury is the hero. There's no other option here. And that's precisely what Mm -hmm. Paul Volcker did. Now, um, to close out tonight's discussion, because I know your your time is valuable, but I wanted to address one part of the book which I found particularly fascinating because it was an element or dimension I had never really thought about, uh, thinking of economics, the gold standard, uh, has sort of the Newtonian paradigm in, in the gold standard. The libertarian idea of how the gold standard being self-regulating, um, how in 1929 or 1931, of course, the gold exchange standard collapsed because of the Great Depression. And uh, you talk about Keynes talk uh, discussing that, but Keynes uh, suggested a, sort of a paper or fiat standard, correct? And, um, and no, you, wait, wait, wait. Uh, it depends on what you mean by fiat. Yeah. Fiat money. That's a that's a, a cuss word. Yeah, you know? I, I, I don't mean. Wait, wait, what I'm trying to get at is, um, in this in the book. Well, here it is. Um, you talk about how uh, the, the the monetary system of the post World War II era, the Keynesian system, uh, how the idea that the economy with the gold standard, the, the idea of the economy being self regulating under the gold standard. So you, you need, you need to know intervention or monitoring or regulation. Right. But that, right. Colla- that, that paradigm collapsed with the great depression. 
Right. Now, McKean said, now we have to be, we have to have uh, some sort of, if it wasn't self-regulated, then some people have to regulate it. The question That's is, right. who's going to be entrusted with that power? And Keane said uh, something with the responsible intelligence, meaning the British, I guess, in your book you write. Um, no, he means, he means Bloomsbury. That's well, what he, he means. That's what I mean. Cause, means go, basically, the higher sodomy. It was people like him, the elite, the children of the elite. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were to run it because he was like a, a myopic Englishman who just basically trusted the prejudices of his class. He called himself an immoralist. Okay, you can't regulate the economy and be an immoralist at the same time. That's mm-hmm. contradictory. That's a contradiction. He thought when he said immoralist, he's probably talking about his sexual life. Mm-hmm. Okay, but there's more to li- morality than just sex. I know this is hard to understand, but yes, there is more to morality than sex, even though sex is very important. And the point here is that if you're going, to, if you say the economy needs to be regulated, what are the criteria? Well, they are moral criteria, because anytime you choose, make a choice, you have to choose the good. And the only infallible guide to achieving the good is morality. It's that simple. So so you got so Keynes gave us an economy. He said, yes, we need to regulate the economy, but I'm an immoralist. Well, that led to the 70s, basically consumerism. Mm-hmm. We're basically saying, oh, anything doesn't matter. Just pump out whatever, you know, lava lamps. Leisure suits, whatever, you know, <laughs> and, and, the result was, and but but you combine this. He was also a promoter of sexual liberation via Blueberry. So you combine Keynesian economics with sexual liberation, which is exactly what the 70s was. And you get uh, basically the mess called uh, stagflation. Now, the oil boycott had a lot to do with that. But I mean, basically what you're saying is you're disconnecting the 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 spending patterns of the majority of the people from the moral law via the birth control pill, okay, which led to this huge disruption of family life. And family life is the basic, it's the cell of society, but it's the basic, in any economy, it's the basic uh, norm for expenditure. As soon as you get married, you have certain things that you do and buy, you need to buy. And you need to form a household and you need to do this and you need to do that. And that takes priority. And these are all productive investments. Whereas if your wife, uh, you give your wife the birth control pill, honey, here's the pill. You're liberated now. Now you go out and get a job. And now we have twice the income and we can buy all like, like a Harley Davidson motorcycle and a boat or whatever. And as a result, you disrupted the entire economy, entire spending pattern, and you diverted it into non-productive uses of money. And the result was uh, basically they felt the economy got out of control, too much debt, uh, inflation, and that allowed the entrance of the villains, villains like Paul Volcker, who created a hugely predatory system of the leverage buyout and cheap money to basically gut the, uh, the industrial the great industrial powerhouse of the United States for short-term gains. And this is just when they're, of course, the trilateralists are setting China up to be the, the new uh, manufacturing center. That's right. Power that's, power that's in my most, in recent, that's in the, uh, in the Nareri biography, oh, the okay. whole, at uh, the Chateau Rambouillet in 1975 was basically the oligarchs through people like Helmut Schmidt and Henry Kissinger saying, we need new geographies of production. We're going to kill Fordism. That's the word they use, Fordism, which basically meant uh, highly productive industrial enterprises paying high wages. And so they, they killed the goose that laid the golden egg. That's exactly what happened. And sexual revolution or sexual liber, liberalism or sexual freedom was a big part of that. That's when Michel Foucault makes that deal. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Michel Foucault is the patron saint of every single university throughout the world right now. He is the Thomas Aquinas of the decadent American empire. I apologize to St. Thomas Aquinas for mentioning <laughs> his name, but it, he is the patron saint. And what is what what would, what did he do? He basically sold out the left. He made a pact with the devil. That's his pact. That's I'm sorry. That's his word. James Miller cites it in his biography. He took LSD in Death Valley, 1975, and came up with the new formula, which is the regnant formula right now, which is basically you give us unlimited sexual liberation. And we won't criticize your economic system. 
That is the world system right now. That's Pete Buttigieg. That's the mayor, uh, uh, the gay mayor of Berlin, Volverite, Visit Am Abba Sexy. We're poor, but we're sexy. So in other words, uh, the ideal citizen is the homosexual now. Uh, we're going to, it's poor, it's low wages. This is a, uh, uh, and if you don't like you know, the fact that you're getting crappy wages, don't complain, don't unionize, go to the gay disco and forget about all your troubles. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, in the end, we're all dead, right? That's right. That's what Kane said. Yeah. And so, no, no sense of uh, posterity or, or the long term. Yeah. Well, no, you never had any children. You never had any children. Oh, wait, was... And I just saw a recent article. No ruler in Europe right now, no president has any children. No one. Not one. I, I, I uh, came across that myself. I thought that was very, uh, very interesting. Yes. yes. No children. No children. Yeah. So, no children, no future. Sorry. Yeah. And so basically, these are, I don't know whether they're homosexuals or not, but the point here is you're supposed to act like a homosexual even if you're not one. And that means no children. It means total dedication to your crappy job and uh, spending the night at the gay disco to forget about your troubles. Narcissism. Yeah. Narcissism. That's right. Now, in, now, uh, you sum this up very well. I'm going to... About Keynes. Keynes' diagnosis of the problem was more accurate than the, the complaints of his detractors, but neither he nor his followers, followers could grasp the complex moral alchemy which led to stagflation. The main source of confidence in the inflationary boom and the borrowing which sustained it was the birth control pill, which gave the illusion of double household income while relieving some, those same households of the expenditures if necessary to provide for children. This gave the liberated birth control pill households of the 1970s the confidence to speculate on property markets in a way that would have terrified the parents' generation. The pill gave way, gave the baby boomer generation, which was the just forming families, the confidence to sustain greater debt and pay for houses and for rent. Unfortunately, the baby boomers didn't understand that the main reason the ruling class sponsored the birth control pill was to drive down wages, something they accomplished by doubling the workforce when women worked outside the home. The crucial change came in 1973, nine years after 1964, which Time magazine had dubbed the year of the pill. 1973 was the year of abortion. It was also the year in which the real, real wages began to decline, but no one was able to make the connection between the two events. It was also the year in which the credit card became the substitute for rising wages. Credit, credit kept the economy going over the short haul. The compound interest ensured that it would stra- strangle it in the long run. The outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live, Keynes wrote in the general theory, are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary an inequitable distribution of wealth and income. The truth of, the, of that statement is not compromised by the fact that Keynes never bent his mind seriously to the question of what production should be for. The answer is that question lay in the principles of practical reason, morality, which are in, in, inaccessible to the self-described immoralist. <laughs> so. That was brilliant. Yes, sir. Who wrote that? No, that's great. <laughs> great. Um, yeah, because um, basically... Uh, it, it, it distorted all of society away from uh, moral moral ends, uh, consumerism, narcissism, as opposed to you know, yes. savings and work and productive work, as opposed to consumerism. If, if they had read Quadro Jesse Morano, they would know there's no social progress outside the moral order. That's what they forgot. That's what Keynes never figured out. Mm-hmm. And of course, him being a self described moralist couldn't have. Of appreciate, uh, yeah, and you're not going to figure it out by hanging around with people like Virginia Woolf and Lytton Strachey. I guarantee you. <laughs> no, you, no, you won't. <laughs> well, okay. Well, uh, Dr. Jones, I've had you a long time tonight. I want to thank you for spending some of your valuable time with me. It's been a Sam, great. it's all, always my pleasure. It's great. The book, I mean, so I can't do this book justice. It's, it's just, it really, it's awesome. It's a, it, you know, it, I read it all winter. Uh, I finished it a couple of days ago, and I'm still, you know, trying to digest it. Uh, perhaps later on I can bring you back on and talk about some other element to it, talk about your new book uh, uh, as well uh, when I get a chance to read that. Um, so we'll, we'll follow up on there. So listen, um, so that's uh, e. Dr. E. Michael Jones, culturewars.com. He's the author of uh, Baron Metal uh, and also the new book. Uh, that was the, the Broken Pump in Tanzania, Jules Nairi and the Collapse of Development Economics just out uh, a day or so ago. You can order that at culturewars.com. And also order a uh, subscription to Culture Wars magazine. So, uh, anything else, Dr. Jones? No, I think we covered it. Great. Okay. Well, th- thanks a lot. I wish you a good night, and we'll talk soon. And uh, uh, again, in the, you know, we'll talk again in the near future. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tim. My good pleasure. Bye bye. No. Thank you.